Welcome to part three of the effects tutorial series. Today I would like to show you how to create a fluid simulation setup within the new effects framework. All right, let's start right away. We go into the Navier menu inside of Cinema 4D and let's just take a look at this fluid dynamics menu and we see we have some presets here that we could use actually. We have some for liquid, for viscous liquids, more complex setups, uh, also for smoke and fire. But it will be good to know what these setups are actually doing. So we create a setup from scratch manually. And the first thing we always need is uh, an effect scene as we have seen in previous tutorials. So I create that one and now I probably would uh, create a, a liquid solver for our setup and I take the inviscid liquid, so I would like to create water in this case, so I use that. I put it inside of the effect scene as any other object. And now we can all see, uh, already see that uh, the axis, the pivot point of our inviscid liquid object is at the minimum of the container box that defines our simulation space. We can see the outlines pretty clearly here so simulation only take place inside of this domain. Uh, when I create a sphere, for example, which I would like to use as a volume source for emissions, in this case it would be particles for the liquid body, I see that it's generated at the coordinate center of Cinema 4D, so zero coordinates, and is not inside of our simulation space. Of course, I could now drag the sphere inside of it, which I could <laughs> indeed do, but I would like the domain now to adapt to that situation. So we have now an origin point here that we can define inside of the liquid object. And I set it to center, for example, and we can see how the domain is shifting to the center or putting the pivot point as its center now and that will be fine for us. We can also customize this location, the center of gravity location uh, with a percentage value here so that's pretty straightforward and very helpful especially when you're rescaling then the domain so you get a more biased directional scaling that way. All right, so let's put it at like 800 because I want my liquid to simply fall down on the floor here. This is just a, the purpose of this tutorial to show you how to set it up actually, a, a basic liquid simulation that you can extend then with features at a later time. All right, but so we have our sphere here and we need it to be a volume. Actually, we had volumes in our previous tutorial. Look it up. So I create a volume here, put the sphere underneath it for convenience and link it in our mesh object link field here, put it inside the effect scene and we see if we get the volume generated. So what we need now are actually the liquid particles that form the liquid body. And we want them to be created inside of the sphere. That's why we created that sphere volume. And now we need particles first of all and for this we need a particle group we generate it put it inside of the effect scene and that was actually it we have settings inside of the particle group object here liquid particles it says and these are the options uh, for the liquid particles that we are about to create and which I will do now with an emitter of course and so we go into that sub menu choose the particle grid emitter which will allow us to create particles inside of a volume. So I put it inside of the effect scene and I can already see now here that I have three slots that I need to fill. And what I can do now is as I need a volume and I would like the emitter to use that volume to emit particles, I drop the volume in here. But of course I use the candidate buttons like this and choose the appropriate object that way particle group 
and emission settings which we do not have yet. And I would like to point out here that the particle grid emitter is really only the emitter. He only knows stuff you tell him. So his default state would be, all right, I have to create particles no matter what inside of that volume into that particle group. But how many and which rate or how long he should emit this, he doesn't know about that one. He's not that smart. So we need the emission settings which tell him what to do actually, how long to emit. And as we don't have yet emission settings, we create them with the candidate button like this. Click on it. And you can already see here now that 4,000 particles were created. As we have now all slots filled. I can now make the sphere invisible so we can see that. Make the volume two. Yep. Generated particles inside of the sphere. If I play the simulation now, nothing happens because we don't have any information given to our liquid solver because at their default state, even liquid particles are just particles. They're stupid. They're like, I'm just here, tell me what to do. And that's what the liquid solver tells them actually. But we have to inform him about them. And we use the candidate button here in the dynamics tab of the liquid solver. And that was actually it. As we do have a global gravity setting here in our effect scene, this will affect the particles that are generated with the liquid solver. Whenever there's something going on dynamically, the gravity value can be triggered. All right, so that works right away. You see, actually pretty easy, only some objects. Well, but another note I would like to give because let's just take a look at this again. And uh, I would like to, to make it stop at a certain point in time. You know, I, we shouldn't keep on emitting and emitting and emitting. I wanted to emit only first five frames. So I go into the particle emission settings and I have a duration slot here. I create a new duration object with the candidate button. <clears throat> Open up the duration settings and now I can tell the emitter or actually the, the emission settings how long this action should last. And I do it in given in frames, so I switch to given in frames here. Enter five for the sequence duration. And that's it. I can now see that the emitter is only emitting particles for the first five frames. And then we see another thing here. Let's take a look at the liquid particles count. We see it emits 4,004 particles initially. And if I now move one frame forward, we can see it actually doubles the particles. But visually, we don't see any difference because the particles are not yet moving that were introduced in frame zero. And in frame one, well, the emitter is stupid, as I said. He just knows I have to emit particles. So it just generates new particles at the same location in this case. Is that really necessary? I don't think so. So we have to tell the grid emitter, the particle grid emitter, somehow that he should watch out and only generate particles if it really makes sense. You know. All right, and so we go into the particle grid emitter and we can see we have a link field here or a list that says fluid dynamics. If I drop the fluid dynamics in here, go back, and now go one frame further, we can see it didn't double the particles anymore. It just creates some more, probably at the surface areas where uh, considering, if you look from the top, fewer particles are inside of a grid cell or a voxel because this is a particle grid emitter. It, it is all based on the underlying grid and we can see the cell size here. So it will probably generate new ones, especially in these surface areas where lower particle counts can be expected. But this helps very much actually 
and we can save a lot of performance uh, because we have less particles to be simulated. So you should actually always do this, except you really need it for custom setups to be different. And by assigning a liquid solver here in this case to this list, we get another nice feature. So if I move the sphere out of the domain of the fluid domain, you can see that no particles are created outside of the domain. If I hadn't assigned the liquid solver here, so remove it, you can see that it will generate new particles everywhere again. Again, the particle grid emitter is just an emitter, he just knows I have to do emission. So these are the two things that actually are very, very useful and we simply assign it here so we don't have any of these problems anymore that way it takes care of it and, and we all, anyway just want the particles to stay inside our domain inside where we we can move them around where they exhibit the fluid motion all right so it falls down on the ground now it has a nice motion actually to it but let's extend our framework now let's extend our setup the first thing I would like to do is maybe pushing the particles along the z-axis. So what I need is an external force somehow, you know, an additional force that pushes the particles to that direction. And I can create these now. We have the forces submenu here. And I could create now, of course, as we do have particles, I could create a particle force, acceleration. Let's just do this. Take this. Put it in the effect scene as every other object too. And as I know these are this is a particle force, I intuitively put it under my under my particle group. Now I select the particle group and I can now link the acceleration force down here at the particle forces list. Drop it in here and can now change the acceleration direction. I said I wanted to be along the z-axis, so I changed the acceleration vector, add some intensity, like 70, alright, I will also make this timeline a little longer, it will get brighter the faster they are, and we can already see now that the force is already acting on the particles, there is, it's accelerating them. One problem that I see now here is that the force, well, the force is stupid again. It just knows I have to emit acceleration to the particles. And that's all it does, no matter where the particles are located in space. But that's not what I actually wanted. I wanted the particles to get the acceleration only at their emission source, at the volume that we have here, you know. Only in this area and only inside the domain. I've already clamped the particles to the domain, but now I need to constrain the emission only to the inside of the volume. And that's what we will do. We will constrain, now we have a constraints submenu here to that volume. So I take a constrained volume, put it in my scene. And I know I would like that volume to only be evaluated with the acceleration force, so I intuitively put it down here. But actually, FX doesn't care. You can place it wherever you want. The hierarchy is of absolutely no importance. It's just interfaces here that we have. All the calculations are done in the background. Anyway, for my own convenience, and personal preference I put it down here and now I need to define a volume well I take the one we have candidate button assigned go into the acceleration force and drop the constraint volume in here and now if I play simulation swoop we can see that the particles only get acceleration at the volume source and in all the other space the fluid simulation simply takes place so, it's that easy. Creating particle forces, 
constraining certain actions to, in this case, a spatial area. But we have a lot of other constraints that I will introduce to you in one of the next tutorials. But you can already see how powerful this approach is, actually having access to all the individual functionality. But this is very straightforward and easy to learn. Hope to see you in the next tutorial.